Okay, we're finally going to get to the fundamental theorem of algebra. Actually, we, we've been talking about the fundamental theorem of al algebra now for the whole chapter. We just haven't formalized it, so here we, here we go. Uh, let's start off by looking at this, though. Find all the real zeros of this quadratic polynomial function. The answer is, it doesn't have any, does it? What if you want to find all the complex zeros of this polynomial function. It turns out it has two, doesn't it? The, if you solve this equation equaling zero, you get x equal plus or minus two i. In fact, couldn't you factor this polynomial function as x plus two i times x minus two i? And that's basically what the fundamental theorem of algebra says. It says if you have a polynomial function of degree n, and you're even going to allow complex co coefficients, although in most cases on our homework we have real co coefficients, but it even works with complex coefficients, all it says is then that polynomial has to have at least one complex zero. It does not say it has to have a real zero. Notice here, this, 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 this one doesn't have any real zeros. We can apply the uh, fundamental theorem of algebra re repeatedly and get this result, which is saying something a little bit more useful. It says that, if you, in fact, if you have a polynomial function of degree n, then that polynomial function can be completely factored into linear factors. The only catch is you have to allow complex numbers as your factors. And that's, that's kind of what happened here. A very innocent looking poly polynomial function. You can't even factor this over the reals, but you can factor it over the complex numbers. So, so the, the uh, complete fact factorization theorem says that. So let, let's, let's see how we would do that. How we would do that. This is a polynomial function degree three. It, it says, the theorem says that this can be factor into linear factors, three line linear factors. The only catch is you may have some complex num numbers there. Well, what we're going to do is find one factor, one factor that would work. Um, you could use the rational zeros theorem somehow, but uh, I just happen to notice that p of 1 equals 0, right? p of 1 equals 0. So uh, that says that x minus 1 is a factor. Now, how would you find the other two? Well, if you use long division and you divide x minus 1 into the polynomial, it goes in evenly, it better, and your quotient is x squared plus x plus 2. So then what you could do is set this um, quotient equal to 0. Uh, unfortunately, when you do that, uh, it doesn't factor. You'd have to use the quadratic formula. You end up with two non-real solutions. Anyway, so what the, what the complete factorization theorem says is um, you could factor this as x minus 1, that would be one of the factors, and since negative 1 plus i radical 7 over 2 is a 0, x minus negative 1 plus i radical 7 over 2 is a factor. Since negative 1 minus i radical 7 over 2 is a 0, x minus negative 1 minus i radical 7 over 2 is a factor. So we, we, we factor this into linear factors. I know it seems messy, but if you were to multiply this out, you'd get this, right? Here we go, revisiting the, the properties of poly polynomial zeros for the third time. Notice uh, the, the last part D is the important one. It's only if the zero is a real number will it be an x-intercept of the graph of P of x. Okay? Anyway, so uh, well, let's keep on going. Suppose you wanted to um, suppose you wanted to find all the zeros of this fourth degree polynomial function and you wanted to factor it over the complexes. Well, sometimes you might be able to factor. You don't always have to use long division here. This one does factor, and then you can factor each of those factors more. Notice x squared plus 6 factors into x plus i radical 6 times x minus i radical 6. So we've demonstrated what the theorem says. This polynomial function of degree 4 can be factored into four linear factors, right? The zeros are plus or minus i squared of 6 and plus or minus 2. Uh, so it also illustrates what's called the zeros theorem. We talked about this also. If you include the multiplicity of the zeros, then you can actually say this. Every polynomial of degree n has exactly n complex zeros. If you allow com complex numbers and count the multiplicity of the zero, then every polynomial of degree n has exactly n zeros. So look at this example. Uh, this zero at x equal 2, since it has multiplicity 3, this is going to count as three zeros. So how many how many uh, zeros does this poly polynomial function have? Well, you got to be careful here. Look. Um, this is going to be x minus 2 to the third, so this is going to count as 3. 
this factors into x plus square root of 5 times x minus square root of 5. Now over here, let's factor x squared plus 9 as x plus 3i times x minus 3i. So when you square it, you can square each of those factors. So if you look at here now, we can answer the question, how many zeros does it have? This is going to count as 3. This is going to count as 1. This is going to count as 1. I, I, sh I should say 2 counts as 3. Uh, negative square root of 5 counts as 1. Square root of 5 counts as 1. Minus 3i counts as 2. And 3i counts as 2. That adds up to 9. So su summarizing it differently, you could say you could write it like like this. Look at this right here. Uh, let me ask you this: When I multiply this out, am I going to have any square roots in my final answer? You can kind of look at it and say yes, because uh, when you multiply this out by the FOMA, you get this. So when you um, use the uh, distributive law, you can see you have plenty of square roots in your answer. How about this one? Are you going to have any square roots in your an in your answer when you multiply this out? It's not too hard to see that you're not, and the reason is because you have the the factor times its conjugate. When you multiply times its con conjugate, the square root of 2 goes goes away. Doesn't this become x squared minus 2? So when you multiply it out, you get a polynomial that looks like, like this. So the important thing is going backwards. If you have a polynomial with real coefficients, then if it has any irrational zeros, they have to occur in conjugate pairs. That's what this says. And the same thing is true with non-real zeros. Uh, let me ask you this. If you were to multiply this out, are you going to have any i's in your final answer? The answer is yes. It's not too hard to see that, because when you multiply the first two together, you get x squared minus 1. So when you use the FOIL method, you are definitely going to have i's in your final answer. How about now? When you multiply these factors out, are you going to have any i's in your final answer? The answer is no, because again, whenever you have the con conjugate here, uh, the, when you multiply these two together, you get x squared plus 9, so when you multiply it out, you get a polynomial that looks like this. So my point is, if you have any complex zeros of a polynomial with, with that has real coefficients, the only way that can happen is if the the complex zeros occur in conjugate pairs, just like with irrationals. That's what, that's what the conjugate zeros theorem says. If you have a polynomial p with real coefficients, if you have any complex zeros, they must occur in con conjugate pairs. Okay, so let's do a few more of these fun problems. Um, let's suppose you want to find a polynomial with real coefficients of degree 3 that has zeros at 3 and 1 plus i, and p of 1 is 4. Okay. If it has degree 3, then you should be able to factor it into three linear factors. Uh, you only have two here, but since it has real coefficients, you know that if 1 plus i is a 0, 1 minus i must also be a 0. The conjugate of this must also be a 0. So you could factor it like this. a is some constant times x minus 3, and again it's going to be x minus 1 plus i times x minus 1 minus i. This is how you'd factor it. When you multiply it out carefully, you get this. Uh, notice um, the last term, you're going to have the difference of two squares here. You're going to have 1 minus i squared, which is going to be 2. You also notice that the xi's cancel, so you end up with this. Now, the way you find a is you, um, you use the fact that f, p of 1 is 4, so you set y equal 4 and plug in 1 for x, and you end up with um, a equal negative 2. You can check me on that. So this is your final answer. Um, you don't have to multiply it out. Okay, why don't, why don't I give you one to try? See if you can do this one. I'll, I'll give you a couple minutes and then I'll, um, I'll give you the answer and you can just take a screenshot of the answer. So like I said, I'm not going to go through this whole thing. I'll let you, uh, you follow this. But basically, it's going to factor into... It has rational coefficients, so you know that those are real. So you have to have 3i and you have to have minus 3i as zeros. But since there's rational coefficients, you have to have, if 1 plus radical 2 is a 0, so it's 1 minus radical 2. So you have x minus 1 plus radical 2 and x minus 1 minus radical 2. When you multiply this out carefully, you get down to here. And uh, you use the fact that um, p of 0 is 1. You find a is negative 1 ninth. This is your answer. And the last one, um, try, try this one real quick. Hit the pause button, and then... Um, uh, the answer is here, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.